Welcome to the Best of MBS, where you can enjoy some of the best interviews by Michael Bungay Stanier, author of The Coaching Habit and How to Begin. So it's a stressful situation. And of course, what's fantastic is you just don't have any fights with anybody. I mean, everything is harmonious. You get along well with everybody. You really see people for the really complex, messy, glorious human beings you are. You don't misinterpret anything. You don't get triggered by anything. It's just going absolutely smoothly. And, you know, that, that's just never happened with me. I know with <laughs> I'm under stress. I, I get twitchy. I get argumentative. I take offense at random and weird things. And bizarrely enough, people take offense at stuff that I say, which, you know, you know me, that's inconceivable. I'm such a nice person. So of course, you know where I'm going with this. We need to figure out not only how to communicate, but we also need to how to deal with conflict. So I have the perfect guest for you. Another Toronto friend of mine, so that's always nice when I'm doing a bit of kind of local hometown hurrahing. But Leanne Davis is a organizational psychologist who advises leaders on both strategy and team effectiveness. She's distilled her 25 years of experience into three books, including her most recent, and this is terrific. It's also, we, we share a publisher, page two on this. The new book is The Good Fight. Use productive conflict to get your team and your organization back on track. Leanne, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much, Michael. Even though I mispronounced your surname. <laughs> oh, did you? I didn't even notice. I think yeah. I did. Leanne Davy. I think I might have said Leanne Davies, but it's Leanne Davy. Only one and of me. It's only one of you, exactly. And it's so nice that you're having this conversation with me. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. So conflict must be basically just an everyday human thing. And yet we all, well, most of us are just so bad at it. What's, why is conflict so hard? A couple of reasons. One, because we are biologically wired to get along harmoniously with our in-group so that we didn't get voted out of the cave and eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. So <laughs> right. we, sort of come, we come out of the womb um, conflict avoidant, at least for our in-group. Um, and then we're socialized as children to learn that conflict is not polite, it's not nice for half mm. of the planet, that it's certainly not ladylike. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of messages. And then when we get into the workplace, it gets even worse. And, you know, either um, you've been given 360 degree feedback about how you're too direct. or <laughs> There are a lot of messages yeah. in, in our cultures, particularly uh, talking to someone who's at least a... Um, a second half of life Canadian, <laughs> you'll right. understand that Canadians are particularly bad at it. And those in the Midwest, in the US, and uh, I hear from folks in Scandinavian countries, we, we can layer on national culture uh, in terms sure. of conflict avoidance. So we're just bad at it for a whole bunch of good reasons. I love that. That's, a, that's actually just a nice thing to hear right off the start, which is we're not bad at it because we're bad. We're bad at it for a whole bunch of reasons that have helped the human race survive and thrive and get along and be successful for assorted millennia. Exactly. But it's one of those Marshall Goldsmith, uh, what got you here won't get you there. Where our civilization is now, we need conflict. But yeah, we wouldn't have got to where we are without the kind of cooperation and collaboration that gave us an advantage over all those other species that had sharper teeth than we did. So one question people might be thinking, and I say that because I'm thinking it and I'm just assuming everybody else is like me, is going, is this, is this actually a skill worth building or can I just kind of try and get through the second half of my life by avoiding conflict in the same way that I've done that for the first half of my life? I mean, why would I take the time to get better at managing and avoiding, but also really stepping into conflict? I think because conflict is inevitable. And so if we start in the workplace, um, think about the kind of prioritization trade-offs you're having to make right now. So I'm thinking of many of the clients I'm working with making really tough calls about if we have to lay off half of our right. employees, how do we choose who? If we can, I was talking with a client at one of the big banks and they have a very massive 
critically important project and they're trying to decide, do they have to put it on hold? So trade-off decisions, prioritization decisions are really a, a form of conflict. And um, working with one another, uh, being able to get along and, and avoiding the friction that comes with more and more and more of our work being team and cross-functional teamwork. And then just learning to advocate for ourselves, stick right. up for ourselves, get recognized, get rewarded, get promoted. All of these things require us to master conflict. So if we avoid it, uh, we, we miss out. We get into what I call conflict debt. So if we avoid these situations where we're forced to have a difficult conversation, make a difficult choice, then this debt piles up and we start to pay interest on that conversation that we should have had. Mm -hmm. But as we leave it and, and don't um, get to the other side of the conflict, uh, if we just keep stepping back from it or hiding from it, all sorts of negative things happen for, for us as individuals, for our teams, for our organizations. So it's pretty important. I mean, I know as a psychologist, the way human beings interact and show up is just part of your academic background and your and your wiring as to what you're interested. But why conflict? Why did you pick this as a thing to focus on and specialize in and then bring your teachings to the world? Because it's what I suck most at. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, yes. The yes. old, you, you teach what you most need to learn. That of sounds so course. familiar. Of course. And it was very funny. When I was in graduate school, my husband, who I met in graduate school, he was taking a class on vision. And almost everyone in the class didn't have 3D vision. It's this very <laughs> rare thing not to have 3D vision. Right. But, you know, everyone who didn't was suddenly studying vision. So that was me. Uh, I'm terrible at conflict, brought up in a very conflict avoidant household. Uh, and it bit me in the butt at some point as I started to manage and lead teams. So, yep, this was the book that I needed to read, so I figured I would write it, and teaching it every day is a really great accountability mechanism. No kidding, no kidding. You know, Liam, when I think about how I show up in the world, I would say I just don't have that many opportunities for big conflict. Um there's something about maybe the structures or the people in my life or the way it is that we don't get into raging fights. It just doesn't really happen that much. But there's there's just there's a lot of low level irritation. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm wondering if what you have to teach. Uh, actually, what I think the question I want to ask you is: do you, Do you deal with? Should you be dealing with the low level irritation, or is that stuff that you should be just going? You know, I'd be the better person and step aside, and you know, stop being so petty. I wonder. Yeah, I wonder how you feel about that. Question. Yeah. So people will often ask me, uh, you know, shouldn't I pick my battles? That mm. that expression is very common, and uh, it depends. If you can honestly say that that's irritating me, I'm I'm sort of I'm monitoring myself. I can see my heart racing or feel my palms getting sweaty. Or if you can be in touch with your own irritation at something and you can say, you know what, that's not worth being irritated over. That's more about how they're doing it. And we agree on what they're doing. So let it go. Or if you can honestly let it go, then I would say do that as much as possible. Right. Because we do fight over things, particularly how somebody does things when we agree on what they're doing. Um, that's just not a good use of anyone's time or energy. Okay. But the big caveat is most of the time, I think we can't let things go. And so I do this little thought experiment with people. I say, okay, imagine that your boss asks you to send out a presentation to all your colleagues on your team. And, the, and he says, you know, it's really important you get some feedback. And so the, the first message back to come from your teammates is from the person uh, that has been annoying you a lot lately. <laughs> and you open the message. Oh, I know who that person is. <laughs> <laughs> Most people do. It never takes audiences long to remember who that person is. And you open it and it says, I got the draft presentation. I caught a couple of mistakes. I have some ideas for how to make it better. And I'll come by your desk at three o'clock. And most people sort of in the audiences when I'm speaking yell out that this makes them feel, you know, angry or frustrated or defensive or yep. these sorts of things. And um, most of them report, you know, trying to get a last minute dentist appointment at three o'clock rather than having to have the interaction. <laughs> and then I right. say to them, OK, now I want you to imagine that the second email that comes in is from the person on your team who you just trust implicitly, your, mm. your favorite person on the team. Sometimes it takes them longer to think of that person. Mm -hmm. um, and I say, OK, you click open 
open the message and it says, I got the draft presentation you sent. I caught a couple of mistakes. I have some ideas for how to make it better and I'll come by at three o'clock. And, you know, universally people will say that when their friend catches the mistakes, they feel relieved and grateful. When their friend has some ideas for how to make it better, they're excited and interested and they're filling up the jelly beans and their candy dish for right. three o'clock. Right. And so the problem with letting irritants go or not addressing them is that every one of those irritants gets added to that filter in your brain that decides right. whether the email is nasty or nice, whether it's um, mm. you know helpful or hurtful. And so if we are only pretending that we're picking our battles, if, if we're you know holding a grudge or carrying resentment, we're going to experience that person, every interaction with that person, an email, a walk past them in the hall, a meeting with them, a right. conference call, every one of those things differently. And that's what scares me is that so often we, we tell ourselves a good story that we're picking our battles, but really what we're doing is holding a grudge and grudges multiply like debt, right? That mm -hmm. conflict debt idea soon will be paying uh, huge sums and then you will get a blowout. Then you will get something that's really unpleasant and unhealthy. So that's my caveat. If you can uh, be tuned into yourself and honestly say, I don't think this matters. This is something right. I'm going to let go of. Great. But if all you're doing is adding it to your conflict debt, you're really setting things up poorly for, for the future. One of the interesting things about that scenario that you've painted is um, sometimes conflict is a systemic issue rather than a, a specific issue. You know, there's a moment where you're like, some, I mean, there's all sorts of times where somebody can just do something that drives you nuts and you're like, we need to, we need to clear this and sort this out. Yes. But if you're saying, look, I have a relationship that is broken and it means that everything that happens gets interpreted through the lens of broken relationship, you know, useless, nasty, hopeless person who's being useless, nasty and hopeless with me deliberately just to annoy me. It feels to me that here we're going beyond conflict and it's like needing to do some kind of deeper repair work. Yeah, I think that's where if you get to trust being violated at the level of integrity, which is sort of the, the deepest mm -hmm. level of it, it, it's funny because when we work with teams where trust has been violated and re relationships need repair, people assume that it's an integrity issue, that it's the most dire kind of form of, of trust being gone. But instead, it's often a lack of connection, a lack of credibility, a lack of reliability, things that are much easier to fix. But when you get to the situation that you're describing, where it's really about someone's integrity, are they out to get me? Uh, are they making me vulnerable? All those sorts of things. Then yeah, there's really deep repair work that needs to be done. And, and interestingly, there are many cases where it's not feasible in the work environment to do it. And at some point we, we interact with people who have become, you know, victims in their own minds uh, and who can't recover. They can't believe again. And right. those right. people often end up needing to leave a team. And so the reason we do so much of this work around uh, the good fight is to make sure that we're out ahead of that. So that yeah. that little email that's, you know, pissing you off, that yeah. you deal with it so that it never gets to that point. Because a lot of the time it's not reparable once it gets to that point of, of questioning someone's integrity. So set me up to have a good fight, Leanne. I mean, here's, here's the context. You know, it's it's a difficult world. I mean, it might be, I and mean, we're recording this now with COVID-19 causing havoc everywhere, but, you know, in four years' time, it will be a difficult world for different reasons. So it's a difficult world. It means that my brain is at least partly hijacked by my lizard brain, my little amygdala. It's going fight or flight. And why run when you can have a battle? <laughs> and but I'm, but there's one small part of me the, some side of me the angel side of me is going do this well <laughs> make this a useful battle not just a flailing in the dark yelling at you kind of shadow type of battle yeah where do i even yeah. start to be able to have a good fight so the first thing is just that moment in your own head before you open your mouth of just okay where am i at am i stressed out 
you know, am I already feeling anxious? Uh, am I breathing only in the top of my lungs? Like just even a check in with myself to say, is this the right moment for this? Or am I even perceiving this properly? And- how, do you, how do you get good at that though? I mean, oh, that, that, that moment of like, uh, you know, that, that pause, that breath, that moment of mindfulness, that moment of emotional intelligence. Yeah. I've heard rumors of it. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm the same. I'm, I'm decent at it now, uh, at work because just from practice. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing my own cues. So, uh, my palms are very useful. They get sweaty, Mm. which is, um, very glamorous, but it's very (laughs) useful because I can now I'm tuned into that. I recognize it when it happens. And, you know, as a facilitator, you have to become very good at that because there are things that participants do that trigger me, right? Yeah. Make me want to tell them this is a good method. Like just trust the process, right? You know, you want to go into yeah, that yeah. mode. So you have to be very good at recognizing that, okay, that's where I'm going. Switch to a question, switch to a question, switch to a question, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, it's it's really practice. Um, you know, it's always harder the closer you are to home. So with my 17-year-old, uh, you know, I can be three steps down into not being mindful before I'm like, oh, that was uh, so not how I should have handled that. So it's just practice. You know, um, it's, it's really helpful for people to hear two things. First of all, practice is how you you de-trigger yourself. Yeah. You you practice not being triggered. Yeah. Um, you know, this kind of comes back to some of the stuff around habit formation that people will know about around. If you don't know your trigger, you will be triggered. Yes. Um, and that idea, which I talk about and I love, which is the body leads the brain. Yes. Like get, get used to get aware of how your body moves into that pre verbal <laughs> moment. Yes. Catch it there. Uh, yeah. Cause if you can catch it there, which is like, you know, for me, I get into my, I have a, I have a kind of a serious face. <laughs> just like my, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm normally a pretty, a pretty smiley guy, but if yes. I'm, if I'm not amused, I'm really, I really look not amused. I inherited this from my mother and um, I can, uh, and I'm like, if I can feel my, the downturn of my mouth and the kind of pressing of my lips, yeah. I'm like, Oh wait, this is a clue that I'm pissed, but I haven't said anything yet. Right. There it is. Right yeah. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's just practice in getting good at that. And, and literally for me, just being able to have that moment, there it is, you know, there go, there go the palms or there goes my pulse or, Mm -hmm. um, those sorts of things are really, really useful. Um, and, and that moment, and really it is a moment is all it takes to click into a different mode. And then the mode is also something that needs to be a habit. So the technique that I teach people, I call validation Mm -hmm. and, Uh, validation is what you do in that moment. So when someone says something that makes you defensive, uh, makes you angry, makes you frustrated, triggers the conflict, um, you go through these three steps. And again, they're just habit and practice. So Mm -hmm. just like as a kid, we learned, uh, you know, we had fire safety and you learn stop, drop and roll, right? And Mm -hmm. every kid knew stop, drop and roll. (laughs) Every kid was sort of waiting to be lit a fire so they could stop, stop, drop and roll. So it's just like that. So the first thing is to validate. So what we want to do in that moment when someone says something we don't like is we want to contradict them. We want to tell them how wrong they are. We want to speak our own truth instead of hearing theirs. So the first step is simply to just do something that says to the other person, I heard you, I'm listening, I see you, you know, Mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Um, And that can be simply paraphrasing. So you think my presentation doesn't have enough detail. You think I'm worrying about something that I don't need to worry about. You know, you don't have to agree with them. You need to say something that says, I hear you. If you can't even say something like that, you can be very authentic. You can say something like, wow, that's hard to hear. Yeah. There's no reason to be ingenuine about it Mm -hmm. at all. Um, So that's the first step. So just make the first thing out of your mouth, um, their truth, not yours. Or even a um, a comment on the process. Yes. 
Yes. Rather than absolutely. an engagement with the content of the process. Yes. Absolutely. So you're so like, let, wow, you're, 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 wow, you're giving me feedback on the presentation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, exactly. Wow, that's hard to hear. You're, 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 there's a meta commentary. And there's something exactly. about, it goes back to that first step, which is about catching yourself and not being pulled into it. Right. You know, I, I often right. think emotional intelligence, in my mind, it's being enough outside yourself that you can see what's happening and you can make some decisions about whether that's working for you or not. Right. And, and the it, more you it can keep such practice. <laughs> it does. The more you can keep kind of stepping out going, Oh, this is the look at the, look at the drama that's playing out just gives you a few more choices. And I love yeah. this piece around make your first comment, not about the content, but about right. the process or yep. about kind of what's got, what you notice going on. Yep. And that just helps you increase the odds that you don't get sucked into the details. And and it also does the same for the person who's made the comment in the first place, right? Because right? sometimes uh, people will say things that are, you know, very hurtful or whatever as they land, but that wasn't their intent at all. And so saying something like that, like if you say, wow, you know, that, that wasn't what I was expecting to hear right now, they may go, oh, you weren't? Um, oh, uh, okay. I, like, right? It gives them right. some, some meta feedback as well. Yeah. Then the second step is you can ask them a question, right? So mm -hmm. just get to a question and, and you like, know, what who the hell about, do you think you are? <laughs> um, so it's funny. A different uh, question? <laughs> so, well, so with uh, the coaching habit and with my work and, you know, you yes. and I are both fond of great questions and That's teaching right. people about open-ended questions and questions that don't start with the word why and all these sorts mm -hmm. of things. And I did have a client once say to me, well, then as far as I can tell, WTF is a perfectly fair question. <laughs> I was yeah. like, well, it does meet all the It does criteria. meet a lot of the criteria. <laughs> it, is, it is slightly rhetorical, but that's okay. Yeah. We'll let it go. <laughs> <laughs> so asking a question to understand where they're coming from. So if someone is saying to me right now, I think you're worrying about this, uh, you know, our loss of income. If my husband says to me, okay, you know, you're fretting about our loss of income and it's too soon. We're only in week one. Then I can ask a question, right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, so how are you thinking about this? You know, how long do you think we should continue as normal before we think differently? When, when do you think would be a good time to reassess or, you know, I can ask a yeah. question to kind of understand where's he coming from. I could ask, how are you thinking about this? How are you right. staying calm? How, you know, but a question that again, gets you a little deeper into understanding where they're coming from. Um, if, if it's in a work scenario and they're telling you, you know, your presentation didn't have enough detail in it. Okay. What kinds of things were you looking for? What did you expect would be in here? What do you need to know to feel confident? Those kinds of questions. So that's the second step. And then between can, can just, going, let me, yeah, if yeah, I can yeah. interrupt. So one of the questions that I want to ask, but I don't ask often, enough and I love your guidance on this is to go something along the lines of what's the what's your data for that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, because so often when somebody makes a comment it's like 98.3 percent judgment and opinion and a bare sprinkling of actual fact <laughs> and yeah absolutely I'm always curious to go where, where are you getting this from but I've never quite found a good way to ask that question. <laughs> I'm wondering well, if you have a, a a way of approaching that. Yeah. So I, I, first of all, I agree with you very strongly that we get into judgment versus observation or reality. And that's where so much of the defensiveness comes from, right? So somebody will say something like, well, you were disengaged through my whole presentation. And, well, what do you mean I was disengaged? I wasn't disengaged. And what you really want to say is, what, what made you, you know, what was your evidence, right? What was your, what was yeah. your data? And the, if the person can say, oh, well, I, I just felt like you were disengaged. Okay, so help me figure that out. And if they can eventually say, well, your eye contact was with Sally, not with mm -hmm. me while I was talking. Okay, there's right. data. There's evidence, right? right? right. Oh, I didn't really, I think I was only looking at Sally because I was interested in how Sally was responding or something like that. Um, so uh, when it gets to, if what you're, if what you're doing is questioning the veracity of their claim, that's where you have to be so careful mm -hmm. because you're going to make them defensive. Probably right. best to go a round or two of letting them express how they're feeling. Okay. Literally a round or two. So, and, and Val, okay. So um, you get the sense that uh, this isn't going to land well with our customers in um, the Western region. 
right? And there may be no data whatsoever about right. that. Okay, how, how do you think they might react? What, you know, what do you think some of the risks are? You know, go a mm-hmm. few rounds so that they feel heard. Got it. And once they feel heard and validated, then you have the chance to go, so, you know, it's a really interesting hypothesis. Uh, that you're you know, just making up we... and out of nowhere. God right, damn it, right, right, what's right. wrong with you? Right, but I, you know, I think it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. What kind of data do you think we could look to to find out whether that's true or not? Nice. Um, you know, how might we assess um, the likelihood of that risk? This, know, is, this is really helpful, Ian. Yeah, I yeah, totally so get that. A couple of rounds of validation first, because if your first reaction to them saying something is, well, tell prove me what it. you're basing that yeah. on, prove it. Now you're into a tug of war. Yes, if true. you listen, 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 and they go, oh, this person's an ally, not an adversary. Then mm-hmm. when three rounds in of validating and giving them all sorts of, you know, their truth coming out of your mouth, when you say, oh, okay, I, I think I think we really need to pay attention to that. What are the data we would need to collect to know whether that's true? Got it. Now you're already an ally. So I, I would just say- It's helpful. Go a couple yeah. rounds first. Yeah, and thank then, you. And then the interesting thing about humans, one of the great things about humans is we work on reciprocity. So all this work you've done by in step one, validating them and in step two, sort of being curious and asking questions and listening to their truth is that once you get through that phase, then you go to step three and you can pivot because once you've listened to their truth, the the compulsion for them to now listen to yours will be very strong. It right. is how we work. We are reciprocal creatures. Mm-hmm. So if you say, okay, it's so helpful that you help me understand that. And that for you, this is not the time to change all of our plans and, you know, cut off a bunch of spending and right. start eating rice. Um, <laughs> now let me share how I'm experiencing this. I was up for two hours in the night thinking about this and this and this. Um, I'd love to at least know in the first 30 days that we've taken some low hanging fruit. That would make me feel like we've done a few things. Um, you know, what, what might we look at? What, what are the things we could look at right now Right. that, you know, that would make sense to you? And, and when do you think we should reassess and look at bigger things? So if you've done all the work to listen to their truth, mm-hmm. um, they will be, almost all the time willing to listen to your truth. And that's when you get to the point of saying, okay, now let's turn this into a problem to be solved. And in this form, what you'll often end up with is two truths. They're both true at the same time. The other person's truth holds, your truth holds. And now it's like doing algebra. We have like two equations and one unknown or that sort of thing. And we can just solve. Um, So that's where you get into uh, this pivot where conflict all of a sudden feels like problem solving. And it all starts with validating the other person, speaking their truth before your own. And it's amazing how that just um, neutralizes the vast majority of conflicts. It's, It's my secret weapon. One of the things that occurs to me as you tell that story and you lay out that process is, you know, as you as you were giving us the hypothetical around, well, I've been up two hours overnight and here's what I want. One of the powerful places to have this conversation from is grounded in what you want as an outcome from this. Yes. And it feels to me that one of the reasons conflict kind of circles on and never quite gets bedded down is a lack of clarity around what you want. And it's like, we can't close this off because there's no closure provided by one or both parties. So you then just keep getting pulled back into the, into the, the, the tension that's there without a way of resolving it. Yeah. I wrote, um, I wrote a post a little while back for, you know, when somebody is really in the thick of an emotional reaction to something, what are these three phrases you can use to kind of unlock it? You can almost interrupt them with these phrases. And the first one is, what do you need? Because it's amazing when we get really whipped into a froth, we'll just be going on and on and on about all that's horrible without ever articulating what good would look like. And so being able to say to someone, what do you need? What do, what do you need as part of a solution here? And, you know, in the example I was giving, I might have just said, I need to know that we've at least shut off the crazy spending, right? I need to know mm-hmm. we've shut off. We have like six subscription services. Could we get down to two? You know, something, something like that. Right. So what do you need? And um, the other two, just in case they're useful to people, is uh, where from here? 
So a lot of times people will then start talking about the past. And remember when, when we had the financial crisis in 2008 and we didn't like, and you start going on about the past, right. uh, it's really useful to then say, okay, we're from here. We're from here. And mm -hmm. then the third one is when there's something that neither one of you has an answer to in the moment. The other thing you can do with someone who's kind of in this drama or fretting is you can say, okay, what would we need to solve for? Right. So that just puts it on the table that I don't know yet. And I know you don't know yet, but let's just name it and write it down and understand that this is what we have to go solve for. So those three lines. So what do you need? Um, we're from here. And what do we have to solve for? We'll take somebody who's in this COVID-19 pandemic stress drama kind of mm -hmm. mode and turn them to, okay, let's, let's be allies here. And, right. and let's actually have some forward momentum to the conversation. That, that last one, what do we need to solve for? I don't fully understand that as a question. Can you give me an example yeah, yeah, of yeah. Uh, like what a, a situation and, and, and an answer for that? Yeah. So usually it'll be, so imagine in the workplace, um, you're planning a big project and then someone is going on and on about, you know, sales will never go along with this and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and they're, they're all flustered and you're not in sales and neither are they. And so you might say, okay, so we need to solve for who's going to be our champion in sales. Who's somebody that we have credibility with that we can get to. Mm -hmm. We got, we got to solve for that. Um, so it's, it's what I use when, the two parties to the conflict or the conversation uh, can't address something on their own necessarily, but um, can at least admit together that it's something that needs to be, um, it's part of the process. We're going to have to actually figure that out. It can be a big relief to someone to just say, I hear you that we haven't solved mm. this sales thing and we got to go figure that out. You know, that reminds me of um, a tool Roger Martin taught me. Uh, I mean, not personally, I read it in one of his books, which is around thinking about big ideas and how people can get into a, well, we can do this, well, we can't do it, well, we can do it, well, we can't do it. And that's, it becomes a, um, a circular argument. Yeah. And the way he cuts through that is what needs to be true for yeah. this to be true. Right. Which feels that's like a variation on the, how do we solve for yep. this? Yep, absolutely. You, you kind of go, all right. If for this to be true, these things would need to happen. Yep. And you're like, okay, we need a champion in sales. Okay, we need to have a way of briefing that champion. Okay, we need to have our numbers in order so that we have credibility. We need, and there's a whole bunch of things. And then you can go, that's possible, or that's maybe possible, or that's impossible. And the big advantage of that is in one of those things you've listed, there will be a forward path, right? right. All right, well, let's try that. Like, you know, um, Frank knows Stefan, the head of sales. Let's I go talk to Stephane. Frank and see, yeah. <laughs> see, what, right? see, what, see what Frank has, right? At least you have forward momentum. And, yes. and we get in conflict where we get in trouble is when we get mired in the muck, right? We get stuck. Mm. And if we've got a forward path, if we've got one more stone in the river we can jump to, um, we stay out of that horrible amygdala hijack. It's like, okay, I know what I can do next. I know the next thing. I got the next thing. So we always want to have some kind of a path forward. Yeah, and it's been a great conversation. I knew it would be full of practicality. Um, for people who want to go a little deeper on how to have a good fight, where can they find you and your work? Yeah, easiest place is leannedavy.com, but the hardest part of that is that you'll have to put it in the show notes because both <laughs> my first name and my last name are impossible to spell. Right. So Leanne, L-I-A-N-E, and Davey, D-A-V-E-Y.com. And then LinkedIn is where I love to keep the conversation going, and mm -hmm. um, it's just such a, a great place where I find the conversations are getting better and better these days. Perfect. So that's a, a great place to chat. Leanne, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. You're awesome. Oh, my pleasure. And I'm so glad you're doing this for, for your audience. I think uh, we need calm, smart, sage voices like yours at this time. So thank you. Hey, it's MBS here. If you've got a question you'd like me to answer on video, leave it in the comments below. I'll do my best to get to it.